Welcome to Liberty Explained. This is your guide to libertarianism. Your hosts are Chris Spangle, Julia Geyer, and Levy Rainey. We break down a complicated movement and an ideology and ways that you can understand. We are a resource to share with your friends when they have tough questions. Hopefully we will answer some questions you might have along the way yourself. So feel free to send us a question at ask at wearelibertarians.com. And this podcast is produced by the We Are Libertarians Network. So go check out all of our shows at wearelibertarians.com. Today we are going to talk about the non-aggression principle, which is a foundation, a foundational axiom of libertarianism. But first I want to say hi to my co-host, Julia. How are you today? Oh, I'm great. Thank you. How are you, Chris? I'm doing very well. She's locked down in New Jersey and then from rural Georgia with the 0. 0.3 upload. <laughs> that is not Don't a roast good. me. Uh, Lee, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing really good. I'm pretty hungry right now, so I'm sorry if any aggression comes out. <laughs> okay, well, uh, redheaded libertarians are known for their violence. <laughs> um, all right, so let's talk about the non-aggression principle. So there's something called the Libertarian Pledge. If you join the Libertarian Party, you take the Libertarian Pledge, which is along the lines of I don't, uh, I don't, I will not use force or violence to achieve social or political goals. And that's based on the non-aggression principle, which is sort of the foundation of libertarianism. And so what makes libertarianism different than other ideologies, say, from progressivism or conservatism, is that we all abide by this one single axiom or try to adhere as close to it as possible and judge policies and philosophies based on this single thing. And the non-aggression principle is the belief that like I said, initiating any forceful interference against an, an individual or their property or their right to liberty is morally wrong. So while many libertarians vary on their definition of forceful interference, property, when and how to apply the NAP and the proper response to an aggressor, the movement is largely built on this. And it is basically boiled down into don't hurt people and don't take their stuff. Now, it is not pacifism in that it allows for a defense. So Levy plays the role of the audience here and loves to ask questions. Have you heard of the NAP? Like, what are your thoughts on it? Okay, so obviously I have, but here's my thing is, this is just common sense to me. I feel like this is what our parents, like how most of our parents raised us. And I think a lot of people would agree with this, right? Or no? Julia? Well, Okay, so that's a good question. I think that <clears throat> like people that we know and people in our neighborhood or people in our city or town, the people that are around us agree with this. But um, where this really comes into play is like, how does the state handle this? You know, and um, I, I believe that like most people function like this. You know, your neighbors aren't like usually assaulting you or, you know, people respect each other's like boundaries. They want to go about their business, live a good life, stay out of each other's way and be good to their neighbors um, generally. But um, where this principle can really be applied and should be examined is, is the role of the state. And so um, that's. That's people, what people don't seem, yeah, people don't seem to have uh, – there's a disconnect in that they'll outsource this moral principle right. to other people and make it okay because we've all voted these people in. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know about the two of you, but I just because a lot of people agree and vote on it and the majority decided, it doesn't make the morality of this stuff any different. Right. That's mm -hmm. something you always say, Chris, is you can't outsource your morality. And I love that saying. And, and that's often what's going on between the relationship between like the, the common person and the state. The people do outsource their morality and um, it causes problems. Yeah. So I here's the thing. This is what I've been running into because I've had more friends asking me um, about like libertarianism and so many people agree with like the foundational concepts but when it comes to executing them and actually what that looks like in politics it's so radical but when you go through like this is the core principle so many people have been like oh i think i'm libertarian and i'm like no you're not 
You can see that in the policies that you're standing behind and what you're voting for. And so I guess that's where I'm most confused is so many people can get behind like the general platform. But it's like that leap to actually electing these officials scares people so much. And I don't know why. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I think just courage, it, it takes courage to change. And it takes courage to say, I'm going to do something different and pursue the unknown. Mm -hmm. Even though in a lot of ways, just like, like Julia said, like we live in a state of the non-aggression principle every day without government or with it. Most people would not just walk up and punch people in the face. You mm -hmm. already, and, and then you already have people breaking into houses and stealing people's stuff. And then if you call the police, do they really come and get your stuff back? No, they take a police report for your insurance. Well, mm -hmm. Th that like that basically tells you that you already kind of live in a libertarian society and that there is no people can act with, you know, in a libertarian society, you may have more incentive to not commit these crimes because they're they're the, the lifestyle, the person who's breaking in. You know, we had an incident here in the neighborhood where there were some people breaking into cars and they caught them, actually, because the neighborhood policeman just happened to be outside and the person was on drugs. Well, if you go through the steps by steps of that person's life and background, at some point, there's probably another person in their life that was arrested for drugs and the war on drugs destroyed uh, multi-generations in that family, right? And the state caused, in some regards, that crime. They contributed to the conditions that led to the person in my neighborhood breaking into cars. So, you know, we are we do a bad job of incentivizing that better de behavior, Julia. I have another question. Yes. When go you ahead. Get a minute. Okay. So can you give me maybe like a couple examples of how the non-aggression principle plays out? Like if our government actually adhere to that, what are practical ways that we would see that in daily life? I don't know that you could have the government adhere to the, the good neighbor policy or as Mary Ruart defines it. And so, you know, she, in her book, Healing Our World, calls this the good neighbor policy. And, and it reads, therefore, our program for peace had two parts. One, honesty, tolerance, and respect towards others and their property, i.e., refraining from threatening first strike force, theft, or fraud. And two, repairing any damage we caused by violating the first part. We were referred to this dual approach of honoring our neighbor's choice and righting our wrongs as the practice of non-aggression or the good neighbor policy or libertarianism. The entire premise of government is built on the idea that you take from one group to give to another. You take from one group of people to build a road, to, to give social security, to you know build schools in Afghanistan. And so from the very foundation of government, You've got that good neighbor policy being violated. And then you take the second part of restitution. The government doesn't really care what they do to you, do they? <laughs> you, so they, they, they're the government and you're not. I'm sorry, Julia, you were about to say something. Um, I don't think I was actually. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> I heard you speak up. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with you. Um. I would like to maybe give a, a possible answer to Levy's question about like, how could the non-aggression principle be applied, you know, day to day with, with the state? What is, what is a way that it could be applied if in a perfect world? Like, for example, what do you think, Chris? I think yeah, it, you, you respect the people that live around you. You respect their choices already. Mm -hmm. so, like if you want an example of the good neighbor policy, it's how you already live. Yeah. You want to volunteer, you voluntarily interact with other people, right? Like Julia, you are a business owner. It's important that you treat your neighbors with respect that when you're dealing with business people that you don't defraud them or try to cheat them. Like being a decent person, you're incentivized to do that in the free market system. So like that's an example of the good neighbor policy already kind of at work. But like in terms of the government being a good neighbor, is that ever possible, do you think? Or is it just like against the nature completely? I just think it's against the nature of the state totally. Yeah. Well, that's an unsatisfactory answer, but I just think that it, when you introduce the idea that you can force other people to do things, yeah, 
then it's it's a never ending cycle. It's a never ending slide to from where we started the you know like it's like instantly violates everything. People become intoxicated with the power. Yeah, and so they stop really see like if you watch the vice presidential debate recently, it's like they don't really see us as people. They're just trying to lie to us the best. You know, like if, if the best liar won the debate, right? Yeah. Who got their points out? in the most artful way, as opposed to who's going to be the best neighbor to us. That's so. something that I struggle with so often when I think about the whole concept of government. And I'm just like, is there a way? I, I, I don't know. I mean, that's something I would love to explore in a lengthy discussion, but. Um, I, I think I, it, is it that because I struggle with this too, like it's, and it really boils down to trusting your neighbor. It's not, you, you don't like the government. No. It's just that if we don't have the centralization of force to deal with my neighbors that I don't trust, will I be okay? Will I be safe? Yeah. And, and what I always argue is, are you totally safe now? Or are you more unsafe because of state violence? Is it more depreciative of the society that you're living in? I mean... That's the fundamental question that I run into is, can I trust my neighbor to behave? Because I know I will. I would. I mean, right. my neighbors are good. I have nice neighbors. And I've always had nice neighbors. I've lived all over the place. I think I always say in general, people are good. They want to have a good life. They want to be good. Um, you know, that brings to mind something also. In my experience with like, that's always an argument that people say, like, well, what happens if something bad happens if we don't have police or if we don't have, you know, a state something to call when we need help or whatever. And I have to say, like, I've needed the police twice in my life. Mm -hmm. It completely failed me. Yeah. But however, every time I get pulled over, there's five cops there in 10 seconds. You know what I mean? Right. Um, I'm not a criminal, <laughs> but when something bad happens, it takes them a half an hour to get there and, and they're completely, they don't care. And it, they're inefficient and incompetent. And I'm like, I actually don't think they do anything for me. That's right. my opinion. Um, I know that people have obviously been assisted by police, but I think too often um, we have this faith in the state, but they really, do they earn that? I don't know. Yeah, every law that is passed has to be enforced by the police. And so you want to know why there are more interactions that go south with the police. It's because we're asking the police to do more. The police don't want to be doing traffic stops. They, you know, like that's not what a little kid grows up to be. Oh, I want to be a police officer so I can pull people over and write tickets and fear for my life as I walk up to a car. Like, no, but the, the corrosive nature of a population looking at the state to save them means that we ask the government to do more which means the police have to do more, which means they have to write more tickets to fund the government that we're asking to do more because yeah. nobody can raise taxes because the population will vote the, the bums out if they raise taxes. Like it's a, it's a depreciating cycle instead of realizing we're our own worst enemy by outsourcing this morality instead of governing ourselves. Yeah, I agree. Levy, does that, do you have more questions? You know, I don't mean to beat a dead horse here, but I just have a lot of questions. <laughs> That's fine. So you can edit this out if you want. But I'm just thinking, okay, if you can't say how can how's the government going to implement the non-aggression principle, what would change if – I'm just trying, like, how are, how's the government not implementing the non-aggression principle? And I can see that they're not. But what's an example of them violating that in like, you know what I mean? In daily life. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. If I call CPS right now and file a report, as I have filed reports in the past, I went to the CPS headquarters and I said, oh, and I opened the file and they go, wow, there's 14 complaints in there. I go, oh, it was my first complaint in there. Oh, no, it's not in here. We never filed that complaint. You know, the CPS, they all look at you and they go, this is a really bad situation. We wish we could help. We're sorry. Maybe try the prosecutor's office. Then you go to the prosecutor's office and they go, mm, sorry, our, tie, our hands are tied. We're really sorry. This is terrible. This is happening to you. Maybe try the police. You go to the police. They go, have you tried CPS? Have you? It, the, the administrative state, the bureaucratic state, is full of well-meaning, well-intentioned people. 
And so if you talk to government employees, they're individually not bad people. I don't believe that mm-hmm. cops are bad people, for instance. Yeah. I think that the, the system of bureaucracy incentivizes people to protect their jobs instead of stepping out of the rules that are crushing any effectiveness in the administrative state. So America has has too much bureaucracy. And so there's very few people that you you talk to that interacts with the government or works for the government that feels that they're very effective. Yet they take a lot of money and don't like you work with charities. I work with charities. Julie works with charities. You follow your money. You're you're you will fund a home for children that are suffering abuse. And there will be people that will go out and be more effective and they'll be watched closer by their donors than CPS is because none of us have any idea what's happening at CPS. And if we try to ask, it's propagandized to protect the administrative state. So yeah. um, I, I just look at it and I go, it's not that people go into government to work in these roles. Police officers, for instance, go to work to intending to help people. It's just that in the process of their job through the rules that are set up, it they're not effective at it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In a way that I think they'd even be like to. Teachers are a great example. Teachers love teaching. They want to teach. They don't want to be teaching to a test, which robs them completely of their skill set and their talent. You know, and so it's soul crushing. So teachers are fleeing in record numbers from teaching. So um, I look at the administrative state and I go, "There's nothing about this that is building a well-functioning society. It's robbing people of their passion." Yeah. Yeah, that makes total sense. And I see that play out in like daily life and the lives of my friends too. So, I mean, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, it's it's not that these are bad people. It's that they got into these jobs wanting to help people and then 10 years into their career realize it's a it's a lost cause that's never going to happen. And yeah. then have trouble getting out to go work somewhere else in the private sector. You know, and so I and I hate when libertarians demonize public sector employees because of that reason. Like these these are not people with bad hearts. It's just that they don't see an alternative because we've starved the private sector of good solutions with some of this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, hopefully you learned a little bit more about the good neighbor policy or the non-aggression principle, which I think the good neighbor policy, Mary Ruart, knocked it out of the park. And I love her book, Healing Our World. Uh, it's a great book if you're looking for an introduction to libertarianism. So with that, we thank you. Thank you so much for joining us here on Liberty Explained. Uh, Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Levy, for being here. Thank you. Thanks for teaching me things. (laughs) You're welcome. We will talk (laughs) to you again next time.